Well, this morning, let me pop up that screen for the title. I want to talk to you about God's plan for you in 2017. I thought that little picture was pretty apropos. God's plan and your plan. (laughs) Boy, God's plan looks a little challenging. Hopefully that's not his plan, but maybe it is. Who knows? We always want to have a smooth and easy path, but sometimes life gets in the way, doesn't it? We're going to read a passage from the Old Testament found in the prophet Isaiah, chapter 43, verses 1 through 7, then we're going to skip down to 14 through 19. And the Word of God says this, But now this is what the Lord says, He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt For your ransom, Cush and Seba, in your stead. Since you are precious and honored in my sight, and because I love you, I will give people in exchange for you, nations in exchange for your life. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Verse 14. This is what the Lord says, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. For your sake I will send to Babylon and bring down as fugitives all the Babylonians in the ships in which they took pride. I am the Lord, your Holy One, Israel's Creator, your King. This is what the Lord says, He who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and horses, the army and the reinforcements together, and and they lay there, never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. Forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. Well, it's a new year. How many of you already made your New Year's resolutions? Going to change a little bit here and there. I've made a couple. Although I'm already getting challenged, I was going to drink a little less coffee but I got one of those 30-ounce cups for Christmas. It took a whole pot to fill the thing. And I did it once, and I was so rattled by the end of the day, I went down and exchanged it for a 20-ouncer. So I'll only be rattled halfway through the day. I've also made a resolution that I'm going to grow more hair. (laughs) On my back. You'll never get to see it. (laughs) You'll have to take my word for it. (laughs) You know, resolutions are always funny because we do want to change things. We want to try to improve our lives, and that is a good thing. A medical survey shows that there are now more overweight people in America than average weight people. So the good thing for most of us, we've already fulfilled our New Year's resolution. (laughs) A New Year's resolution is something that goes in one year and goes out the next (laughs) or the other. (laughs) Yeah, you like that? Yeah, well, that's it. So I want to talk about three things this morning. This passage speaks to us in a number of ways. One, I want to tell you to forget the former things. Forget them. You know, one of the things that we do in, in our communion service, many people that I know 
do with communion is that they look at their lives and they see things, especially failures, brokenness, where they fell short, where they didn't meet expectations, where they know that they disappointed God and they, they ask for forgiveness prior to taking the cup and the bread. I know that I do. The words that I say, the small missteps that I make, even the big ones. Every time I come to the communion table, I think, you know, Lord, I, I missed it here. I didn't do the right thing there. And sometimes I think, you know, I know that that's a good thing. But I wonder how God receives it. You know, God is so full of grace and love for us. He's so generous in his goodness that I think he's sitting there sometimes going, why are you wasting my time? I've already forget, forgiven. You, you let it go. We have a terrible tendency in our lives to beat up on ourselves for things, for our remorses, for our disappointments, and like I said, for our missteps. And we hang on to those things because for some reason, they almost feel comforting to us because we know that tomorrow we're going to make the same mistakes and we're going to have the same challenges. And if somehow we kind of beat up ourselves, enjoy our guilt for a moment, cover ourselves with a little bit of shame, somehow we feel as if we're making restitution somehow for it. But God wants us to see ourselves in a new way. He doesn't want us to hang on to what the scriptures call the old man. He wants us to cling to the new man, the new creation in Christ that Maxie spoke about this morning. We are new. We are new because of the hope that Christ puts within us. And one of the great things about God is that one of the most beautiful aspects of who he is is his desire to forgive. He forgives us. And if Christ forgives us, then should we not also let go of our guilt and our shame and leave it behind? We need to sometimes just let it go and let it sit back there. Leave it alone. And even though we do make mistakes and we continue to stumble at times in our lives, God isn't asking us to beat up on ourselves. He's asking us to get up, to move forward. And that's why I love the new year. The new year always feels like that fresh start again. That chance to do things better. If there's one lesson we should take away from the Old Testament, from Israel's history, is that they constantly built themselves up. They were faithful, but over a period of time, they would slide along and step out of God's favor. And God would chastise them and he would speak to them Sometimes he would even bring real hardship on them. But every time, at the end of every one of those chapters, every time God would restore them by his love and his mercy and his grace. When people tell me that they don't understand the Old Testament, when they find it challenging because they see so much violence there, I say, don't you also see the mercy? Don't you get the grace? Don't you see that God's character is revealed constantly to us for a lesson to us? That God never gives up on what he owns. He owns. And that leaves you a, a big question for this new year. Are you his? Are you his? Do you belong to him? Because if you do, the good news is, just like Israel, he will never leave you nor forsake you. He will never give up on you. The reassurance that we have is that he will, no matter what we've done, 
restore us if we're willing to be restored. He will give us new days, fresh beginnings. He forsakes the past. Why do we hang on to it? He lets go. Why do we try to retrieve it? God has a vision for each and every one of us in this new year. It's the same vision that he gives us over and over again. See yourself as I see you. See yourself as I see you. God has this wonderful aspect of his character and nature that he is the beginning and the end. He sees the whole thing, the whole picture. Where oftentimes we are stuck kind of looking at snapshots of time, disappointments, heartaches, hurt. We just lock ourselves, our vision, onto that picture of ourselves, that moment where we are. And yet God sees past that. He sees into our future. He knows the entire journey. And he asks us to see that vision. Because God does new things. God does new things. In each and every one of our lives. And for his creation. And you might ask, why? (coughs) Why does God do this? Because it's part of his nature. Why does God forget, forgive, and restore? Because he is love, as the scriptures tell us. God gives time and time again to us. There's a passage in the very end of the book of Revelations in chapter 21. And John sees this vision. He says these words in verses 1 through 7. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is among people now, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning, or crying, or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To this earth thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this. I will be their God, and they will be my children. I am making everything new. Those words give me a great deal of hope. Because I know the old. I can only see the things that I see and know the disappointments I know. When I think of God's plan for my life, I'm one of those awkward, sort of half-empty guys. My cup is only, well, there's not even a tenth in there. Pretty empty. And I don't know that I want to drink what's left in there. You ever notice that sometimes Starbucks hits the bottom of the pot and there's grounds in your coffee. Nothing like taking that last sip and feeling that sand. Sometimes I feel like that's the way life is for me. But it isn't that way with God. 
God constantly fills our cup. God constantly renews and gives and invigorates and enlivens and gives us life. God is one who's constantly making things new. 2016, good year for you, challenging year for you, good and bad for you. There's some stories in this sanctuary this morning that certainly saw 2016 as an enormous challenge. Where health was challenged, faith was challenged. In this sanctuary, there are marriages that were challenged. Relationships with children that were challenged. In this sanctuary, there were hearts that questioned whether God was with them or not whether they had failed him in such a way that he didn't listen to them anymore or hear their prayers. And that's true in every sanctuary across this land and around this world. And yet, in every sanctuary across the world and across this country and even here in Creston, there is a God who is making all things new that takes all the challenges of 2016 And even though they may carry themselves into 2017, there's one thing that he says, I am your God and I am with you. No matter what the challenge may be, no matter how deep the hurt or the disappointment, God is here to allow us to see the good in things, to feel the renewal of our hearts and lives and minds and spirits. And that there is nothing that we can do except see it. See it. Again, the scripture gives us testimony in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verses 1 through 10. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, We have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling. Because we are clothed, when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened. Because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling. So what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. I like that little phrase there. So that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Most people's greatest fear is not public speaking. Most people's greatest fear is what's going to happen with them eternally. A lot of people aren't aware of it. But if you ask... Where are you going? What's your destination? To whom do you belong? A lot of people speak of no hope. They don't know where they're going. And in that, they find a great amount of discomfort, fear, and anxiety. People do a lot of things to make sure that their names are left behind. That there will be people who think of them and tell good stories of them. But within a generation or two, most of us don't know their names. How many of you can recite your great-great-grandfather's name? Anybody? Good for some of you. Most of us are in the dark. That's why so many people are afraid. We're afraid of being forgotten because we're afraid we're already unseen. People live their lives with fear of anonymity. Of course, there are some people who want to be unseen, but they don't want to be unseen forever. And that's why I believe the gospel speaks to us so strongly. Not only does God see us and know us, he wants to live within us. And when he does, the mortal 
the thing that dies, is swallowed up not by death, but it's swallowed up by life, God's life. Verse 5 continues and says, Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. When we accept Jesus Christ into our hearts, God gives us his Holy Spirit as a down payment and a part of his presence for eternity. And as we become more and more comfortable with that spirit and more and more subjected to that spirit, giving ourselves over to that spirit, we become more and more comfortable with life. Verse 6 continues and says, Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For if we live by faith, for we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we were, are at home in the body or away from it. For we must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one of us may receive what is due for the things that we have done while in the body, whether good or bad. I know that we're also afraid of judgment. I think it's one of the things that robs my heart more than anything else. My fear of disappointing God. Not wanting to... <coughs> be found lacking in any way. And that's why I believe in God's plan for us. That's why I believe that even though we will go through difficulties and there will be challenges and there will be hardships, there will always be an opportunity for restoration, redemption, to be reclaimed by Christ over and over and over again. There's nothing that he can't do with our lives. There's no roadblock that can come before us that he can't overcome with us if we choose to be submitted to him. And that means that we have to do those three things. One, forget the former things. To let the past go. Because all it does is hold us down and hold us back. Two, to trust that God does do new do new things, that he is willing to do new things for us, to give us new beginnings. And to finally, to see it, to see it because he wants us to see it. He wants us to see his love and his life in our lives. He wants us to enjoy his presence and his peace and his guidance and his love. So this morning, as you think about it, what do you want to do with 2017? Do you want to see what God can do? Or do you want to hold on to 2016? Do you want to move forward? Or do you want to stay where you're at? My encouragement to you this morning, move forward. Trust that God will take you where he wants you to go. And if there are stumbles and hardships and failures along the way, remember, he's there to restore and heal and lift up, to guide and direct, to make us better, and to improve our lives. Because that's the plan that he has for us. That's the desire he has for us. Because God never desires for us anything bad. What he desires for us is to be a part of a great future. So this morning, whatever your challenge may be, see that it is paling in comparison to what God wants for you. Let's take a moment to pray. I'm going to ask you to pray <coughs> this morning in a way that focuses on 
whatever challenge you're dealing with. And to ask God to take you through it, to lift you above it and past it. To give yourself to that vision of God who makes all things new. Let's take a moment to pray. Father, thank you this morning for your favor on our lives. Thank you that you are a God who does make things new. And that, Father, we can let go of the past and the disappointments. And we can trust in you that you will take those and cast them away. Help us to see. Help us to see with eyes that you can give us the future that you have for us. Not the challenges, Lord, but help us to see the victories, the good, and especially the grace and love that you have for us, Lord. Father, I thank you for this congregation. I thank you for our friends. And I just pray, Father, that you will help us make Creston and our community and this world a little better because we are choosing to follow you. Father, thank you for your love this morning. And thank you for your blessing upon our new year. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm going to encourage you to stand and join us with uh, one more song. I don't know if you noticed, but I was having a little bit of a problem during the service.